Okay, everybody. Hi. Can everybody hear me? Welcome. Welcome to this webinar. Thank you very much for, for joining me. Um, hello. So just let me know that you can hear me and I'll get on with it. Hi, great. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So I'm reassured now. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. I'm Sue Kay. I'm one of the authors of the Focus series, along with uh, Vaughan Jones and uh, Dan Brayshaw. Today's session uh, is called Focus on Meaning, and um, I'll be speaking for about 50 minutes, and then um, there may be time for some questions at the end. So I'm speaking to you from Oxford. Um, I'm sure many of you have been here. It's a famous historic city, very beautiful. There are the uh, dreaming, the famous dreaming spires. It doesn't look like that right now. It's pitch dark and very cold. So um, I'm imagining, seeing where some of you are from there, I'm imagining that some of you are probably much warmer than I am. Some of you possibly quite a bit colder. But anyway, wherever you are and in whatever literature, um, welcome to this webinar. So this is, um, um, uh, let's get back to the, to, the, to the session. I'd like to start off with um, mentioning the key features of the focus uh, series. These are what we call the three M's, motivation, memory, and meaning. Motivation through uh, engaging content, Content memory, which mainly about uh, repeated exposure, uh, recycling, and meaning, meaningful practice. Um, as I said, this session is about the third M, uh, meaningful practice. But before I go into more detail about that, I'd just like to recap the other two M's uh, for you. So, M number one, motivation. Uh, this. Uh, talking about motivation. He says, or he said, the truth of the matter is that about 99% of teaching is making the students feel interested in the material. Then the other 1% has to do with your methods. Now I'm sure, um, you know, I realise that Chomsky is exaggerating a bit here, but um, the message is very clear that the key to, the, the, to the, a successful lesson is engaging content. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, our colleague Rob Dean did a webinar on um, innovation. Um, I hope you caught it. If you didn't, uh, the, the, the webinar is available uh, to watch again on YouTube or on the focus page of the uh, Pearson website. Second um, then is memory or repeated exposure. Um, vocabulary takes center stage uh, in focus and we take recycling very seriously indeed. Um, this um, uh, uh, research by Paul Nation in, in New Zealand suggests that or has found that uh, students need to encounter it between 5 and 16 times before they know it. Um, apparently the magic number is 7 so uh, um, students need to encounter the same word seven times before they have a chance of knowing it. So that, um, that sort of drums in the cling, as I'm sure you know. Memory, this was a, a memory was the subject of a webinar last week by Vaughan Jones. And um, similarly, you can catch up on that webinar if you didn't manage to see it, either on YouTube or the website. If you did see Vaughan's webinar, I apologise in advance for any repetition, but um, it's kind of inevitable because we share the same uh, beliefs about learning and materials. So, um, as I say, a bit of overlap is kind of in inevitable. So, as I said, the, the, uh, the focus of this webinar is meaning. Um, I'm going to be talking about the way we keep meaning central to everything we do in, uh, in focus. To do this, I've divided the session into three different parts. The first part will be meaningful topics. In other words, appropriate topics for this um, upper secondary age group 
topics that mean something to them. In the second part of the webinar, I'll be talking about meaningful, meaningful contexts. In focus, we base our lesson on material about real people doing real things in real places. Um, all our texts are based on authentic sources, um, adapted and simplified where necessary, especially at lower levels, of course, but without losing the freshness and um, authentic feeling of the original. Uh, thirdly then, and finally, meaningful practice. And in this section, I'll demonstrate some classroom activities. Now, I, um, we at Focus believe uh, that we authors of Focus believe that our students are our most valuable re resource. And so um, these practice exercises that I'm going to show you, students, knowledge and experience of the world and their um, tastes and opinions. <clears throat> so starting with meaningful topics then. So I'm sure you've noticed that in all um, upper secondary textbooks, the same topics come up time and time again. People, study and work, the environment, holidays, travel, uh, technology, health, sport, and so on. Now, these so-called universal topics are fine uh, as a starting point, and in fact, we have to include them for the of us um, uh, very often. So, the, the, the universal topics um, that appear in all course books are fine as a starting point. The challenge for the, uh, for the teacher and for the course book writer is to find new angles and fresh twists on, on these very well-worn themes. In fact, it's a challenge that Vaughan Jones and I, the part of the job that I like best, it's a, it's a really interesting challenge, finding new angles on the old themes. But writing for this upper um, secondary age group also has its own particular set of challenges. It's quite a, a tricky balance to, to get between presenting these uh, upper secondary uh, students with themes for adults and about um, topics and, and uh, issues that they have never encountered, they've no experience of and cannot relate to. And at the other end of the spectrum, presenting them with topics that they may consider to be childish or immature. Um, so, um, I mean, the worst thing I think is um, taking a topic into the upper secondary classroom uh, that they think is more appropriate for 12 year olds. I mean, that's just a disaster. So our solution in focus is to consider our target audience as young adults. So, I'm, I'm going to uh, run through a few examples uh, from Focus uh, now. So, places, one of those universal topics. Place is the uh, topic of this unit, and the topic of this particular lesson, uh, we chose to base it on the Youthful Cities Index. Um, in this lesson, students um, predictably learn uh, language to talk about cities that they know. Now, the Youthful Index sounds made up, doesn't it? It sounded, but actually, it really does exist. Um, it is a global initiative to rank the, top, the world's top 100 cities from a youth perspective. Um, youth, by the way, that's quite an interesting uh, thing. They, they define youth as 15 to 29. And I was interested to read on the um, Youthful Cities Index website that um, youth, according to uh, Europe, is uh, 15 to 24. Youth, according to Latin America, is different. Um, the uh, upper age limit is different, so they think any idea what uh, uh, Latin America considers youth to be? The lower age is 15, and the upper age is uh, a bit better, actually, if you ask me. It's uh, 34. So, <laughs> 22. Oh, God, no. 34. 34. So, very interesting. They've obviously taken the medium uh, for, uh, and for this project. So, 
the criteria used by the cities index to rank the cities um, are the kind of uh, the kind of things that matter are likely to matter to young people things like job possibilities the cost of living um, the cost of accommodation sports facilities and open spaces safety uh, public transport um, nightlife of course and diversity so they rank the cities according to these um, uh, criteria and in the lesson that comes out of this material the students are given the chance to discuss the things that are important to them in a city it's an it's a, an annual study and you may be interested to know that in 2014 uh, in third place was New York, in second place Berlin, and in first place Toronto. You can see the pictures here. In 2015 that, that had changed. The top three cities were in third place Berlin, in second place London, and in top place New York. Um, you can check out uh, where your uh, um, youthfulcities.com website. <clears throat> Okay, so the next, next topic, family. Family um, is uh, in every course book under the sun, and uh, the topic of this unit is family celebrations. Most countries have uh, customs uh, around celebrating young adults uh, diverting to adulthood, and we chose as the topic of this lesson how they do it in Japan. In some countries, 15 is the important age. Um, in, in Britain, it's 18. Um, in Japan, it's 20. Um, so in Japan, they have a festival on every second Monday of January. And anyone who has their 20th birthday in that year on that day. Now, you may think and you'd be right that uh, Japan is remote for most of our students um, they're unlikely to have much experience first-hand experience of the of the country and its customs um, but um, birthdays are universal and this is the point the 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 ingredients of these kind of celebrations are the same wherever you are in the world good food dressing up getting together with families um, uh, speeches, dancing, music, and uh, generally everybody being emotional and having a good time. So this text about Japan is really just a springboard for the students to talk about how they celebrate in their country. Culture. Culture is um, uh, an interesting topic. There are many um, exciting and artists that we could choose to base lessons on. Uh, the reason that um, we chose these two particular artists is um, for the combination of their edgy artwork and their social commentary. So <clears throat> um, the artist on the left there um, is a French photographer called J.R. Um, and J.R.'s thing is that he takes black and white photographs of people and he pastes them in public places. Uh, this particular picture um, shows um, a project called Women Are Heroes. He took photographs of the women who live in these houses in a, a famous favela in Rio and pasted their faces on the facades of their houses facing out into the city uh, with an, the, the aim being to give them some dignity and a voice. He likes to give a voice with his photographs to people who don't usually have one. It's a very interesting project. Um, the one on the right is, I'm sure you know, the now street artist Banksy. Um, Banksy is very popular with young people. Uh, he seems to be very popular with young people worldwide now. I mean, he, he used to be only known, known here in, in Britain, but um, he's become world, worldwide famous and popular with young people because of his um, his artwork um, has uh, uh, always has a message. This particular artwork represents peace protest. 
which I think is really beautiful. In my experience, so this next topic is environment. Now, in my experience, um, I don't know about you, but this isn't my students' favourite topic. You say that you're going to read a text about the environment. Um, and this is a real shame because it's such an important topic. Um, so it's particularly challenging for us teachers and course book writers to come up with a way of engaging the students um, about environmental topics. So um, we found Boyan Slat. Boyan Slat is this young man that you can see in the photograph here. He's um, a young Dutch uh, man. And at the age of 19, he came up with a method for cleaning up. The story goes like this. One day, he went on holiday to Greece and he went diving. He was horrified to find that he could see more plastic bags than fish under the water. And subsequently, he designed um, a, 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 a system, if you like, for catching plastic debris from the ocean. So how it works is this. It's a, it's a, a long uh, thing barrier, 100 kilometers long, actually. And the idea is that the sea, the, the currents of the sea wash the sea underneath the barrier and the barrier catches the plastic. And how it's different from other methods is that they used to use nets, but the nets caught not only the plastic, but the sea life as well. With Boy and Slat's method, he only leaches the plastic. So the plastic is all caught up at the top and then they collect it in containers and the sea life is free to go on underneath. Um, it's a very important uh, invention. Um, you know that there are these five huge plastic um, garbage patches around the world, uh, these so-called gyres. The biggest one is the Pacific garbage patch, twice the size of France. And Boyan Slat's aim is to start cleaning it up from 2020. So to come back to the, the, to the meaningfulness in the classroom, because he's a young guy, the students can relate to him much better than um, if you present them, for instance, with an article full of statistics. Um, the human face and the human story makes a topic more engaging. We found the same with the topic of technology. Technology can be terribly dry, can't it? Um, but we decided to base a lesson on these um, vloggers. Vloggers apparently are the new guys. Um, vloggers being video vloggers. Uh, they are young people who have their own YouTube channels, earn a fortune apparently. Well, some of them do. But they're very clever, they're very engaging. And they have a special interactive relationship with their audience through social media. Um, it's a relatively new phenomenon, but one that's growing and evolving quickly. And it's part of our target markets world. Um, which makes it meaningful to uh, our upper secondary uh, classes. Clothes, I mean, I think clothes is a great topic, I it's a fun topic, but actually it can be a bit tricky uh, because clothes go out of fashion so quickly. Um, you know, if you're writing a course book, you have to write a lesson that's going to last for a few years. Um, not everybody wants to talk about clothes, or they do want to talk about clothes, but with their friends, not in the classroom. And boys don't always want to talk about them. So we decided to base um, the lesson on clothes, um, uh, on jeans, and particularly, or, or specifically, on the history of jeans. Um, so uh, this was, I'm going to read you a little extract from the text that we wrote about the history of jeans. So we started in the 1800s. Denim was a kind of cotton made in denim, de denim. The, the first blue denim jeans were worn by sailors in Genoa, Gênes in French. Bleu de Gênes became blue jeans. In the 1850s, blue jeans as we know them originated during the 1849 Californian gold rush. German super Levi Strauss and Latvian tailor Jacob Davis developed a stronger design using copper rivets. 
etc etc uh, right down to the 2000s uh, today jeans are worn by everyone every american owns on average seven pairs of jeans and i bet it's more than that actually <clears throat> okay finally students of the upper secondary age are beginning to think ahead to um, further study and uh, their future careers so um, having a lesson on how to get a place at university is, is um, mirrors what their, con their concerns are. This um, lesson is about how to get a place at university in Britain, but in the lesson they learn phrases like apply for a place, get into university, get good grades and so on. And so they can take this language and um, use it to, um, to talk about the uh, that they're interested in um, going on to. Work and study, um, we, uh, we, in terms of future careers, we, we chose a female pivot, not just for positive reinforcement of gender equality, although that is important, but also as a way of highlighting the real challenges women face when they, uh, when they choose what are traditionally male uh, careers, male professions. Um, if you look underneath the picture of the, of the pilot there, um, the text that goes with this heading, what makes you happy in your job, um, the, the job with the highest happiness sector was quite surprising. It's not a particularly well paid job and it's the kind of job where people are on their feet all day long. Um, but it was voted the happiest job in the world. Now, any idea what that job could be? It sounds like teaching, doesn't it? But it's not teaching, it's not waitress, no. Waitress, um, <laughs> teacher, yeah. No, I think teacher is probably the best job in the world because it's so satisfying. And it's true we don't get paid enough. But um, in fact, this, I'll give you another clue. I'll, I'll give you, um, they are not really well paid and they're on their feet all day, but they make people feel better themse themselves by giving them a new look and a free therapy session. So did you get hairdresser? Did anybody? Yes, you got hairdresser. Well done. Okay, well done. <laughs> um, not that we're encouraging all our students to become hairdressers, but it was an interesting, uh, it was an interesting conclusion anyway. So those were a few examples of angles on themes um, that upper teens can uh, relate to. And this quote by Henry Widgerson uh, sums up the importance of finding the right topic. If the interest of students is not engaged, the learning process is unlikely to get off the ground at all. OK, so moving on then to the second part of this webinar which is meaningful contexts. Um, in Focus, we use authentic texts, as I mentioned before. Um, in our experience, the more real the material, the more uh, interest the stu interested the students are, and the more likely we are to get an authentic response to the material from the students. So as we go, or some kind of edge, uh, some kind of backstory. I'm going to show you a few examples, and I'm also going to mention a little bit about um, the ways in which we adapt authentic material to make it appropriate and useful as language input for our students. So when we find um, a text that has potential for the classroom, these are the three basic questions that we ask ourselves. Number one is always, is it interesting, of course. Um, is it interesting with our upper secondary class in mind? Number two, is there anything in this text that my students can relate to their own lives? This is important because if the topic of the uh, text is so alien to the students, they won't be able to connect to it at all. Thirdly, and it's very important because we are language teachers, can they learn something about the language? So in this text, is there um, a vocabulary set which is nicely contextualized? 
are there some lovely phrasal verbs um, or a grammar structure well contextualized here so these are the uh, these are the important things to look out for in a text so with these questions in mind let's look at a couple of examples um, so in this first example this is how the text looks um, on the page of the the course book but the original article was in a newspaper and the first thing that attracted me to the was the photograph of this very little girl doing what looked like um, in the newspaper article a very sophisticated painting. So let's apply those questions. Is it interesting? Well, I think this story is interesting. This little girl is a three-year-old painting genius. Um, or is she? Because there's some doubt now that some people have questioned whether um, her paintings are authentic. Uh, can the students relate to it? Um, yes, I think uh, it's a human interest story involved, uh, involving a potentially brilliant three-year-old art. Um, uh, anybody can relate to this human interest story. Um, in terms of does it uh, to any uh, language uh, for the students, yes. When I read the, the article, these um, uh, these um, reporting verbs jumped out at me. It was, the article was full of them. So they're in blue here in the text. So for instance, in the second column there, art critics pointed out that a child not produced these paintings. One critic suggested that her father had painted them. So um, in fact, um, it was absolutely full of reported speech. Um, it's a it, it's a very natural context for reported speech, and that's why we chose to use it. Two more feel uh, uh, human interest stories here. Um, these are two stories about homeless men. Um, are they interesting? Well, I think they are. They certainly went viral on the internet when they first came out. Um, the one on the left is about um, a homeless man. Uh, a woman accidentally dropped her very expensive and valuable diamond ring into his collection cup and um, he kept it safely for her, suspecting she would come back for it and kept it for her until she did come back. On the right, this is the photograph of a, a, a policeman in um, a city in America. Uh, he came across a homeless man um, in, uh, on a very cold winter's night with no shoes on. He measured up his feet and went and, and bought him a, a, a pair of boots. So two heartwarming stories. Can the students relate to them? Yes, I think those are the sort of stories that could happen anywhere in the world. Um, in terms of the language, yes, there was some lovely vocabulary in there. It was a good context for affixation, uh, those words uh, highlighted in red there and there were also some lovely expressions um, as you can imagine things like warm somebody's heart put a smile on somebody's face and make somebody's day so going from a feel good to feel good stories here um, to a feel bad story about exams now um the reason I wanted to include this story is because it's funny and um, humour is a great way to get people engaged to, with material. Um, in terms of language, it is a perfect vehicle for a certain language point. So let me just read it out aloud to you and then um, you can tell me what you think the, uh, the language point that's contextualised is. So here it goes. So I'll just take a drink of water before I read it to you. Right. The exam question. Imagine you were taking an important exam on Monday. What would you do the weekend before? You almost certainly wouldn't do what two chemistry students did in Kansas, Missouri. They went to a different city and partied all night, all weekend. They had a great time, but they knew that unless they got back in time for the exam, so they drove through the night and got back to college in the early hours of Monday morning. Sadly for them, they overslept and missed the exam. When they found their professor afterwards, they decided to invent a story. They told him that they would have, they would have back for the exam 
had they not had a flat tyre. The professor thought about this for a moment and then agreed that provided they arrived before 9am, they could take the exam the next day. He placed them in separate rooms and gave them the exam paper. The first question was simple and worth five points, but they were unprepared for the question on the next page. Question two, which tyre? So, did you um, did you spot the language point? Um, let's have a look at what you're saying. Anybody get what the, there are loads of examples of in here? Yes, conditionals, that's right. So this is what it looks like on the page of the book. Conditional clauses, alternatives to if. And that little funny story um, is absolutely packed with them. Now, so far, um, the texts that I've shown you have been um, newspaper articles and, and magazine articles mainly. Um, I know you can't read this, but uh, it, it, I'm not expecting you to. It's an extract from a novel. So we like to uh, vary the genres. And um, this is an extract from uh, a young uh, Adult. Uh, it's the first novel in a best-selling series written for teenagers and young adults. Um, is it interesting? Definitely. The series centered on the fictional Southern Californian town of Perdido Beach, in which every human over, over the age of 15 vanishes. Uh, do we think the students can relate to it? Well, yes. It's one of those very popular young adult young adult science fiction novels but crucially the first people to disappear are the teachers so i'm sure our students will love that in terms of the language uh, we use this these extracts uh, to develop reading skills um, but as i said it's it's good not not just to vary the genres but also uh, to encourage students to do reading more So now the, um, the last article I want to um, look at is um, this was our um, alternative to give houses and places to live. Um, so it was a little bit uh, going off a tangent here, but we decided to use an article about life on board the International Space Station. Um, now, so. Uh, to apply those questions. Is it interesting? Well, I find it fascinating um, and hopefully so would our students. Can the students relate to it? Well, not directly, of course. I mean, uh, very few people have had first-hand experience of living on the International Space Station, but they may have seen that film um, recently. What was it called? Um, oh, I can't remember, but anyway, it's been it's been uh, it's been out there recently, and also um, the, the you know the the idea of people living up there in space. It's it, you can't deny it's a pretty interesting subject. Now, in terms of uh, the language, we use this text to um, develop reading skills. You can see it's quite a meaty text. Um, it's designed, I think this reading text appears in the B2 level uh, focus. The original text was much longer. It was a newspaper article, 2,664 words long. So we've adapted it down to, or rather we've chosen a part of the text um, uh, to the tune of uh, 600 words. Um, so much, much uh, shorter. I want to just talk a little bit about how we adapt a, an authentic text. So um, in this case, we wanted to keep the text as authentic as possible. So for a B2 level, it's possible to keep a text very authentic um, and um, not uh, rewrite it as you would have to do for lower levels. So um, here's a very short example. An example of how one paragraph from that article has been adapted. So we want to keep the freshness and authentic flavour of the original, but it needs to be um, useful as language input for our students. 
So the top paragraph here is from the original and underneath you've got the paragraph that's been adapted. So straight away you can see that the adaptive paragraph is about a, a line and a half shorter than the original. However, having said that, uh, simplifying doesn't always mean making it shorter. So if you look at line one of the original, in such close quarters, personal hygiene is a must. In cl such close quarters is quite a, uh, it's quite an elliptical phrase and it makes it e easier to understand if you open it out a bit. Um, and if you look at the adapted version, as they live so close together, is easier to understand. We do like to shorten the long sentences though. If you look at line three, the original, even Sunita Williams, who spent 195 consecutive days on the space station, a female record, had her long dark hair chopped to shoulder length, but still had problems. Even I can't say it without stumbling over it. So we would cut down uh, sentences that have many clauses because they're difficult to process. If you look at the adapted version in line three, Sunita Williams, who spent 195 days on the space station, explains how she managed. Uh, going back up to uh, the first line in the original, um, in such close quarters, personal hygiene is a must. A must, in must used as a noun, is quite a low frequency uh, word. Higher frequency is essential, as you can see in the adapted version. So we um, exchange low frequency vocabulary for higher frequency vocabulary. Uh, so line two, a delicate chore has been by difficult, which is a high frequency word. If you look down to uh, line six, uh, rather line eight in the original, I put some shampoo in my hand and moosh it around. Moosh is not even in the dictionary. So we replace that by the line six of the adapted version, move it around and so on. So we replace low frequency words with high frequency words. We also um, take out any cultural references that wouldn't resonate with our student or with students worldwide. So the example of this paragraph is in line two, um, uh, it says many astronauts use a music festival favorite, moist wipes. Now, if you've been to a music festival, you understand the reference. Um, however, we can't assume that all our upper secondary uh, students have been to a music festival and that reference may just go through their head. So safer to get out. So to recap then, the aim is to maximise exposure to high frequency vocabulary because these are the words that the students are most likely to meet again and again. Um, by high frequency, I mean the words that are in the top 3,000 most common words in the language. Um, there are low frequency words in this text, of course there are, and we didn't uh, replace words that were um, essential to the topic of the of the text, if you like. It, so in the original, in the first line, um, weightless is a low frequency uh, word, so is astronauts, but we didn't replace them because this is a text about the international chin. Other words in the text that we didn't replace were panoramic view, gravity, and mission control. These are all low frequency words, but um, they are specific to the topic. So in a nutshell, that's how we uh, deal with um, an, uh, an authentic text without messing with it too much. Right, well, it seems very quick to uh, have come to this stage, but we are at, uh, in the last section now of the webinar, Meaningful Practice. And uh, meaning practice uh, uh, for me means exercises that set the students up to make meaningful utterances, to say meaningful things. 
So to demonstrate what I mean by meaning full, um, I think it's very useful to start by showing you an exercise I consider to be meaningless. So this is um, it's an exercise that we took off a website. It's um, recognize the type of exercise. It's a ubiquitous uh, gap fill exercise. And the students have to complete the sentences with the correct form of, of make or do. Mm, so um, how much money does a waitress make? Could you do the washing today? So, so far, so normal. The reason why uh, this meaning less is because the sentences have absolutely no connection to the student's real life. So how much does a waitress make? Unless you've been a waitress, you can't really answer that question. Anyway, where? Uh, in, in England, in France, in um, Rio, in Timbuktu? Um, that's, it's, it's, it doesn't really have intrinsic meaning, that question. Uh, could you do the washing today? Did Tom's business make a profit last year? I don't know. I don't know. Who's Tom? Um, and so on. It's an exercise that talks about people who don't exist, uh, situations that the students have no experience of, and it's language for languages sake. So let's contrast that with a similar exercise, which I consider to be meaningful. So very, very similar, complete the questions with the correct form of make or do. Did you make, did you make your bed this morning? Do your neighbours ever, neighbors ever make a noise? Do you like doing washing up? Very similar because it deals with the same uh, language point and it's a gap fill. But the difference is in the second part of the exercise. So the second rubric, ask your partner the questions, sends the students back to the same sentences to recycle the exercise as a speaking exercise. And it's in this personalised uh, part of the exercise that the, um, the interaction between the students becomes meaningful because they're, talk they're exchanging real information. Uh, did you make your bed this morning? Um, uh, yes, of course I did, and so on. So um, this, is, uh, this is the difference. Um, I just want to, uh, I'm going to show you some other ways of uh, techniques for getting this personalization stage into grammar practice activities. But before I continue, I just want to um, make the point that by personalization, I don't mean students to talk about deeply personal issues. Of course not. Um, I would never do that with students, and I, wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't suggest doing it with. Uh, this age group, I think they would be very reluctant to talk about anything too personal. It's more about getting them to talk about um, real situations that mean something to them. So let's have a look at a few more examples. Here's another uh, exercise where, in this case, the students have to complete the collocation with the right um, uh, words. So have you ever broken your leg, chest? or toe, obviously chest is not usually broken. Uh, burnt your tongue, fingers or ribs, you, you can burn your tongue, you can burn your fingers, you don't usually talk about burning the ribs. Um, cut your teeth, lip, etc. So the students get the exercise right from the point of view of the correct uh, patients, but then they can either leave it there or the exercise can be recycled as a personalization uh, and the students ask one another the questions. This kind of activity is also very, it's not only good for um, recycling the language and making it meaningful, meaningful to the students, but it's good to have up your sleeve for uh, fast finishers uh, technique. Um, here, the students first have to replace the underlying adjectives with synonyms, the synonyms they have already seen uh, in, in context. Um, so, for example, Hannah is very hardworking. Uh, the synonym, I think, is studious. Hannah is very studious. She's always in the library. 
Dan has a logical way of thinking. He likes problem solving, analytic. Uh, Jim is a social, sociable person, gregarious, and so on. So the students get the, the right words. And then the second part of the exercise requires the students to replace the names to describe students in the school and then discuss it with your partner. Um, obviously, this exercise only works because the, the sentences are positive. It wouldn't work if you were to ask the students first to replace the adjectives with opposites. So, for instance, number six, Rosa is really stupid, she gets everything wrong. And then ask them to replace the name with the names of other students. That wouldn't work at all. So, um, caution when you're doing these personalizations. Even when students are working on their own, they can um, associate the, <coughs> the sentences with something personal. So in the top right hand exercise there, <clears throat> first the students find the words that are described by the definitions underlined there. And then they go back to sentences and take the ones that are true for them. Whilst they're doing that, of course, they are engaging with the, um, with the words on a personal level and they become more memorable because of the personal association. <coughs> oh, excuse me. In this exercise six here, the students are required to write sentences that are true for them. And so, again, they're associating the language with something that is meaningful to them. So number two, uh, for example, by the end of today, I probably won't have drunk enough water. And um, that's probably why I've got a dry throat. OK. Um, some language, it's difficult to personalize. Um, doesn't mean to say you can't get the students engaging with um, the language on a, on a meaningful level. So take the first sentence here, for example, breaking the law. So it, would, it wouldn't be advisable to have the students ask one another, have you ever broken the law? Or, um, for instance, um, when was the last time somebody in your family broke the law? <clears throat> that, that, well, you can, you can see why that's not a good idea. However, you can write sentences that the students can agree or disagree with, as in this case. So, for example, breaking the law is always wrong. It's a bad idea to make people aware of your political views. Teenagers have no idea what they stand for and so on. So polemical uh, statements that um, the students can agree and disagree with. They're still engaging uh, with them on, on a personal level. So these are my beliefs. Um, these are the beliefs of all the, um, the authors of uh, Doom Focus. I believe that meaning should be all practice activities, however controlled or free and at whatever level. <clears throat> because learn, the students learn more effectively when engaged in activities on a personal level. And I'll finish off with one of my favourite quotes. It is the need to get meanings across and the pleasure experience when this is achieved that motivates second language acquisition. So that was a, a, a whiz through uh, M for meaning. Um, Look where we're going next year. Um, I say look where we're going. I'm going to have to fight Vaughan Jones for um, a trip to these places. Um, he's in me, but I'm still going to fight. So um, I look forward to seeing you um, in one of these places. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed for listening. <laughs> it was a pleasure to come to Braz Tiesel. Gosh, I wish I could go every single year into every Braz Tiesel event. <laughs>